Okay, so my talk is, what happened to the Constitution? And as Oscar said, I am a lawyer, and so I have to start with a disclaimer. <laughs> and so here's your warning. Uh, the following statements have not been approved by the U.S. <laughs> Supreme Court. So, sorry about that. So basically, you're going to listen to this at your own risk. Uh, and if you should happen to be involved in any legal dispute with anybody, uh, consult with your lawyer and, and do what he says you should do. Don't go by my statements, because courts go by what the Supreme Court says the Constitution says, not by what I say it is. Okay? So keep that in mind. My lawyer died in the middle of the case. Ah, uh, okay. You need to get another one. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you some names. Okay. All right, so um, first I want to ask you some questions. So we're going to do a little survey here, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. I want to know what your opinions are about certain things. Now, sometimes, sometimes this is just going to be your gut feeling. You know, maybe you haven't studied it a lot or whatever, but uh, just just raise your hand if you say yes on any of these things. Um, I want to know what you think. Do you think the Constitution should be interpreted according to original intent? Yes. Okay, most of you do. Okay, do you think the Constitution is meant to guard our liberties? Yes. Okay, most of you seem to think that. Now, what about judicial activism? Good thing or bad thing? Who says it's a good thing? Bad. Okay. It's both. I don't see any good. I, I, anybody? Okay, who says it's a bad thing? It's both. Okay. All right, and we have somebody who says it's both. So Depending on which way they apply it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we'll get into these subjects more. Uh, do you think the Supreme Court crossed the line when it said it could strike down acts of Congress? No. Was that usurping a power that it shouldn't have? Do you think it was going too far, anybody? Okay. Person, okay. A couple of people. All right. Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk about this. We'll get into this more. Now, do you think the Constitution protects your right to privacy? It should. Do so you think it's supposed to? Do you think it's, it's supposed, supposed to protect supposed your right to privacy? Okay. Hey. And do you think it protects your right to wear a hat? Hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Even, even that hat. <laughs> Especially that hat. Okay. And uh, does it protect your right to start a business? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Most people say yes, they're nodding their heads. Okay. And does it protect your right to buy an iPad? Okay, most people are nodding their heads yes. yes. Uh, that would be in the iPad clause, right? <laughs> right to buy an iPad. Okay, so um, what I'm going to explain in this, I'm going to say that I think the Constitution should be strictly construed when it's regard to government power, and it should be broadly construed in regard to individual rights and liberties. And we should interpret the Constitution not for original meaning, but for, not for original intent, but for original meaning. Okay, and then explain the difference between those two terms and why I think original meaning is a better way to look at the Constitution. And I'm going to explain how the Constitution protects your natural rights, which is basically your right to live your life as you see fit. And that includes the right to speech, right to privacy, and so forth. And that the Ninth and Tenth Amendments are the keys to understanding the Constitution. And I'll explain why the Supreme Court should strike down un unconstitutional acts of Congress and how courts have been too passive, not too active. And I'm going to talk about the need for judicial engagement, which is the need for courts to stand up for our rights, basically, against the overreach of the other branches of government. It's a little different from judicial activism. So let's just talk about a basic thing first. What is government? And I'd like to go to a quotation that has been attributed to George Washington. It's not entirely clear that he actually said this, but whoever said it, I agree with it. And it is that government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. So remember that when government wants to pass a law and they want to make people behave a certain way, if you don't behave that way, then men with guns will come after you and make you behave that way or put you in jail or seize your bank account or something like that. Uh, so there is ultimately force backing up everything the government does. Now the founders knew that fire could be a very useful thing. You could use it to cook your food, but if it got out of hand, it could burn down your house. So they found a place to put a fire, and that was in a fireplace. And that way they could harness its energy 
could cook food, it could warm the house without burning down the whole house. And they also knew that government could be a useful thing in preventing people from interfering with the lives of other people, but it could also be a dangerous thing if it got out of hand. And they found a place to keep government, and that's in the Constitution. So the Constitution is basically a limit on the government powers. Now, how should we interpret the Constitution? And uh, I say that it should be according to its original meaning. Now, what is original meaning? Well, Thomas Jefferson said that the original meaning of the Constitution is the true sense in which it was adopted by the states, that in which it was advocated by its friends. So it's really not about intent. It's not about what the founders were thinking, because sometimes that gets kind of awkward. You get into this mind-reading game. Well, you know, I think uh, James Madison would have done this, or Thomas Jefferson would have done that, and you're trying to read the mind of somebody who's no longer living and apply it to a modern-day situation that they never had to deal with. Uh, so really, when you're looking at original meaning, what that means is it's a more objective way of looking at the words of the Constitution. In other words, it's not what somebody was thinking when they wrote the words, but what words did they actually write? What did they actually say? What was the rule that they gave us? And that is more consistent with the way that we usually interpret legal documents, like a contract, or a will, or a statute. You're not so much interested in what the person was thinking at the time as what did they actually write down? What words did they agree to? And what do those words mean objectively to people at the time? So this way the Constitution doesn't change unless we agree to amend it. And um, what happens sometimes is that the meaning of a word will change, and I'm going to give you an example of that pretty soon. The meaning of a word will change, and therefore the law changes because that word is in the Constitution. So we don't want to have that. We want to have it meaning the way it was understood at the time that it was ratified. And if we want to change it, there's a process for changing it. We can go through that process. So is the Constitution meant to guard our liberty? I asked that question earlier. Well, a libertarian Constitution, and that's libertarian with a small l, meaning it's pro-liberty, would protect your right to live your life, raise your family, and use your own property as you see fit, while restraining only those who interfere with the rights of others to live their lives as they see fit. So how does the Constitution do these things? Well, it does it in two ways protecting individual rights, and limiting government powers. Now, a lot of the time, that's really two sides of the same coin. Because when you limit the power that government has over you, then you have more individual liberty. But a lot of passages in the Constitution will seem to be concentrating on one thing or the other, either your right or the government's limited powers. And I say that the Ninth and Tenth Amendments are the keys to understanding and interpreting the Constitution. Let's take a look first at the Ninth Amendment. This is the key to protecting individual liberty. And let's take a look at the words of the Ninth Amendment. There's a picture of James Madison who wrote it. And it says, The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Okay, well that may not be the most exciting legal prose that you've ever read. I don't think I've ever seen anybody at a protest march with a <laughs> sign that says the enumeration, the constitution of certain rights, etc., etc. But, but let's talk about the context in which this was written, and I, then I think you'll understand what it means much better. And Madison said this when he was introducing this amendment to the first Congress. He said, it has been objected also against a Bill of Rights that by enumerating particular exceptions to the grant of power, it would disparage those rights which were not placed in that enumeration. Okay, now let me give you a little bit of background here. Uh, you may remember from studying history that when people were discussing whether to ratify the Constitution, many people complained that there was no Bill of Rights in it. And some of the people who were against a Bill of Rights said, well, there are really two reasons you don't want to have a Bill of Rights. One thing is there's no way you can put every right into it. You can't list every right. What about the right to hunt on Sunday? What about the right to wear lipstick and high heels? Uh, what about the right to wear a hat? What about this right? What about that right? You could name 100 rights and somebody else would name 100 rights and it'll go on and on and on. 
So first of all, it's impossible to list all your rights. And second, and this is probably even more important, if you list just a few rights, then people will start to say that the rights that you did not list are not protected by the Constitution. So that is a very important point. Now Madison goes on to say, it might follow by implication that those rights which were not singled out were intended to be assigned into the hands of the general government, meaning the federal government, and were consequently insecure. This is one of the most plausible arguments I have ever heard against the admission of a Bill of Rights into the system, but I conceive that it may be guarded against. And that is why we have the Ninth Amendment, which says that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Now, in my opinion, this is the most important and probably most overlooked part of the Constitution. Because if you read Supreme Court cases, and I've read a lot of them, they hardly ever mention the Ninth Amendment. And the whole idea here is that really the presumption is the presumption of liberty, as Randy Barnett says in his book, Restoring the Lost Constitution. Randy Barnett is a law professor at Georgetown Law Center, and uh, one of the few libertarian law professors around. But basically what it means with the Ninth Amendment is, yes, rights are open-ended. Basically, you should be able to do what you want as long as you're not hurting other people. So the Ninth Amendment really protects these rights, your natural rights, your right to live your life, the rights to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness, the right to wear a hat, the right to buy an iPad, the right to wear yellow socks, even. Okay, now, I have to say the one about yellow socks, uh, even though the Constitution doesn't prevent you from wearing yellow socks, uh, you may have to ask your wife about that. Um, and... and Wives override the Constitution. I guess, just remember that. Uh, so uh, let's go on and let's talk about the right to privacy. Well, you may hear many times, but particularly from conservatives, the word privacy is not in the Constitution. So does that mean that privacy is not protected by the Constitution? Well, no, because what does the Ninth Amendment say? The enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights doesn't mean that they're not protected. Privacy is your right to be left alone. So your rights are open-ended, they're broad. As long as you're not hurting anybody else, you have a right to privacy. So what does this tell us about interpreting individual rights in the Constitution? It means you interpret individual rights broadly. You don't go in there with a microscope and say, well, I don't see this right listed in the Constitution. Uh, it doesn't have to be listed. Uh, we have freedom of press in the Constitution. Does that mean you can have a blog? Yes, even though, of course, the founders didn't know what a blog was, and they weren't thinking about what a blog was, but that's your right to express your opinions in a broad way and publish them to the world. So, yes, you have all these rights that are not necessarily enumerated in the Constitution, but you still have them. And how else does the Constitution protect our rights? Well... There's the rest of the Bill of Rights, and most of these are much better known because they are listed and because you hear about them all the time. Probably aware of most of these, the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, right to keep and bear arms, freedom against unreasonable searches and seizures, and the right to a jury trial. Those are among the enumerated rights in the Constitution. <laughs> Let's look at the Tenth Amendment. This is the key to limiting government power. And what does this say? Well, it says that the power is not delegated to the United States. And here, United States means the federal government. This is the new government that the states were creating. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it, by the Constitution, to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Now, the main takeaway from this is that basically the federal government does not have any powers unless they're listed in the Constitution specifically. So it's the exact opposite of rights. Rights are open-ended. Powers of the government are limited. So what does this mean? Uh, it means that you interpret government power strictly, narrowly. You don't go reading a whole lot of extra powers in there that don't belong there. Now, Congress's powers under the Constitution are listed in Article 1, Section 8. There are 18 clauses of it. There are also a few powers that are added later in the Constitution or that were added by amendment. But there's got to be 
some place in the Constitution where a power is listed or the government does not have that power. Now, as I said, there are 18 clauses in Article 1, Section 8. I'm going to just focus on three of them, because I think most of them are pretty understandable and are self-explanatory. But there are three of them that uh, there has been some problem in interpretation. So let's take a look at them. And I'm going to start with the first clause, which says that the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes and duties, imposts, etc., other kinds of taxes, to pay the debts, that's one of the reasons, and to provide for the common defense so that we have an army and navy in case somebody tries to invade us, and general welfare of the United States. Okay, so it's pretty clear-cut except for this phrase, general welfare of the United States. What does that mean exactly? What is welfare? Well, this is one of those words that has changed over time. So let's take a look at an earlier definition, closer to the time of the founding era, and this is from Webster's Dictionary in 1828. You can also look at things like Samuel Johnson's Dictionary, which was in the 1700s, look up a definition there. But Webster's definition is exemption from any unusual evil or calamity, the enjoyment of peace and prosperity, or the ordinary blessings of society and civil government. So basically, welfare was means you're doing well, you've got peace and prosperity, you're enjoying civilized society. That's the kind of thing that we want to have in the United States. And let's look at a more recent definition. This is from Merriam-Webster 2012. Welfare is aid in the form of money or necessities for those in need, an agency or program through which such aid is distributed. All right. Now, of course, the, the first definition still applies these days, but uh, you probably hear it used in the second form more often these days. Here's what Madison had to say about the General Welfare Clause. And of course, he's one of the people who was writing uh, the Constitution. He said, money cannot be applied to the general welfare otherwise than by an application of it to some particular measure conducive to the general welfare. Whenever, therefore, money has been raised by the general authority, meaning the federal government, and is to be applied to a particular measure, a question arises whether the particular measure be within the enumerated authorities vested in Congress. If it be, the money requisite for it may be applied to it. If it be not, no such application can be made. If Congress can do whatever in their discretion can be done by money and will promote the general welfare, the government is no longer a limited one possessing enumerated powers, but an indefinite one subject to particular exceptions. Okay, so basically, if you said you could do anything, as long as it's for the general welfare of the country, well, uh, and you don't have to tie it to a specific power, you don't even need to list those other powers. Congress will just say, well, we're going to tax and get some money, and we're going to spend it for something that's for the good of the country. And there's no limitation to it. Those other 17 clauses in Article 1, Section 8 would be superfluous. And I think what you've got to realize from this description that Madison is making about the purpose of government is think of the United States as ideally being an ocean of liberty with little islands here and there of government power which are come into play when somebody is interfering with somebody else's rights. And the reverse of that would be you have an ocean of government control with little islands of liberty dotting here and there which would probably pretty well describe uh, the way North Korea is run or the way the former Soviet Union was run, where you have a totalitarian state and the government tries to control just about every aspect of your life. Now let's go to another clause in Article 1, Section 8. Now notice the first clause starts with the Congress shall have power, and then all the other clauses start with to do something. And I'm going to go to Clause 3. The Congress shall have power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. And this is really important. Let's uh, show it in bigger font. Uh, and there are three words or phrases that are in this clause. This is usually referred to as the Commerce Clause or the Interstate Commerce Clause. There are three words or phrases that are really crucial in understanding it. What is regulate? What does commerce mean? And what does among the several states mean? Now, Randy Barnett, uh, whom I mentioned before, professor at Georgetown, did a study of the ratifying conventions that took place in the several states 
when people were deciding whether or not they were going to go along with the Constitution. And, and the debates went on and people talked about what these things meant and what the implications were. And so he looked at how they used these words, regulate, commerce, and among the several states, how they interpreted these phrases. And he also looked at dictionaries of the time and newspaper articles of the time to understand how these words were understood at the time of the founding. And here's what he found. Regulate, that means to adjust by rule or method, to direct, to make regular, does not include the power to prohibit. So an example of a regulation that most states do, for example, is if you're writing a will, they want to have two people who are witnesses to your signing it uh, to make sure that when you were signing that will, you were in sound mind, you knew what you were doing, you weren't being coerced to write the will or anything like that. So um, that's just a rule that is put in place to prevent fraud. And uh, it, it's just to make things go more smoothly when the person dies, because of course when the person dies they're not going to be around to say, oh yes, that's what I wanted in my will and I meant to leave this to so and so. So it's uh, just a little rule to make things go more easily. Commerce, what does that mean? In one word, trade. It's the buying and selling of goods. Now, it does not have anything to do with the way the goods come into being. So it's not about manufacturing or agriculture. It does not give Congress the, the right to uh, say how things are going to be made or how crops are going to be grown or something like that. It just has to do with buying and selling of goods, and among the several states means between people of different states. So if you're selling something from Florida to somebody in Georgia, that's interstate commerce. But if you're selling to somebody in Florida, then that's not interstate commerce, at least the way the Constitution was originally understood. So what is the Commerce Clause really for? Well, it's to keep trade regular among the states. It's so that you don't have tariffs and trade barriers from one state to another, and so goods can flow freely across state lines. That's basically what it's for. So if a, a state tries to create a tariff of goods coming in from another state, the federal government can step in and, and uh, get rid of that. And I'm going to skip ahead now to Clause 18. Again, this is uh, one that has caused some problems. And that gives Congress the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper, this is called the Necessary and Proper Clause, for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all of the powers, etc., etc. Now, of course, there was a big debate about this in the Constitutional Convention. A lot of people said, well, that phrase, necessary and proper, that's, uh, that's quite a problem. That sounds like you're giving Congress a blank check to do whatever they want. Well, it doesn't just say that Congress can make any laws that it thinks are necessary and proper. It can make any laws that are necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. In other words, the powers that are listed in clauses 1 through 17 of Article 1, Section 8. So it's not unlimited. It still has to be tied to a particular enumerated power in Article 1, Section 8. Now, um, let's, let's take an example here. This is one of the enumerated powers. Congress shall have power to establish post offices and post roads. Okay, so basically they have the power to create a postal service that delivers the mail. Okay? Now, it doesn't say how they're going to do it. So you look at the necessary and proper clause, and it says that they can make any laws that are necessary and proper for carrying out one of the enumerated powers. So to carry this out... In those days, they probably had to create something like this. They would have a system with horses uh, that would draw mail carts, and you'd have somebody uh, taking the mail from one place to another. Uh, these days, we don't use horses and mail carts anymore. We use trucks and planes and things like that. Uh, so it's a good thing that the Constitution did not specify the exact means by which Congress had to carry this out. So really, the necessary and proper clause is about Congress finding the means to do something. But the end that they're doing it for has to be something that is listed in the Constitution under the enumerated powers. And I think that's how you have to understand the necessary and proper clause. Now, also, let's take a look at those words necessary and proper. Okay? So you want to do what's necessary, but not something that's excessive to get it done. So uh, going back to the example of the 
the mail cart and the horse, uh, you wouldn't want to have a mail cart that has uh, pulled by 20 horses or something like that. You wouldn't need 20 horses. So that would not be necessary to get the mail delivered. You wouldn't want to have a gold-plated mail cart. You know? Just what's necessary. And then also what's proper. So it still has to be something that's lawful. You can't violate somebody's rights in carrying out uh, these, uh, in executing these powers. And uh, it's got to be constitutional. It's got to recognize principles of federalism. It's got to recognize the rights of the states and so forth. And individual rights as listed in the Bill of Rights, including the Ninth Amendment. So really there are a lot of restrictions on the means that Congress can use. But this is making it open-ended for what kind of means they can use as long as they're necessary and proper. Okay, so just a brief review. Constitution protects individual rights with the presumption of liberty and with the enumerated rights in the other amendments, and it limits government power because government has only the enumerated powers in the Constitution, the federal government, that is. Well, so what happened? <laughs> uh, how did we get runaway government, massive debt, so only $20 trillion now, right? Uh, pocket change. And uh, uh, loss of liberty. Uh, the government seems like the government's in every aspect of our lives these days. So, so what happened? Well, I attribute this to judicial passivity. These guys, the Supreme Court, just sitting on their butts and letting the other branches of government, the executive branch and, the, and Congress, just run roughshod over our rights and our liberties. And I'm going to give you a step-by-step explanation of how this happened. I'm going to go through some Supreme Court decisions that greatly expanded the powers of government. And I'm going to start with the clause that I just talked about, the Necessary and Proper Clause, which says that Congress can make laws that are necessary and proper for carrying into execution the enumerated powers. And the case is called McCulloch versus Maryland, and it was in 1819. And these cases are going to be in chronological order, by the way. And so, 1819, the issue was whether the charter of the Central Bank of the United States was going to be renewed. Now, there had been a central bank founded under George Washington's first term, and uh, it had an expiration date on it, so the charter had expired, and it was time to consider whether to renew the charter, and this was under Madison's administration. And so, the people who were in favor of renewing it were... Very, very clever about this, they were able to tie this to a particular enumerated right. And that was Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, the taxing power. They said, well, it says here Congress has the power to lay and collect taxes. Well, you collect taxes, you got to put the money somewhere, right? So they need a bank to put it in. So the question then became, was this necessary? Was this necessary for Congress to actually have a bank? Um, now, the people who were against renewing the charter of the bank said, well, wait a minute, you know, in George Washington's time when we had the first central bank, there were very few banks in the United States. But now, 1819, there are lots of independent private banks, and all we have to do is just what any other business would do. You open an account at a bank, or even accounts at several banks, and you put the money there, and when you have to pay your bills, you write a check. Uh, and so you don't need for us to create our own bank. And so that was the argument that was going back and forth about creating or renewing the charter of the central bank in 1819. So it came down to this question, was the central bank really necessary and proper? And the Supreme Court had to interpret the word necessary. So here's what the Supreme Court said about the word necessary. Necessary means convenient or useful. Well, okay, it seems to me convenient is a little bit more lax than necessary. It might, might be convenient to steal somebody's car sometime, but I don't, I don't think that necessarily <laughs> means that it's necessary. Uh, and it's certainly not lawful, it's not proper. So um, anyway, uh, this was kind of the beginning of Congress starting to side with bigger government and giving it more power than uh, was originally intended in the original meaning of the Constitution. 
Uh, next one has to do with unenumerated rights, and I'm going to talk about the Ninth Amendment, which says that just because your rights are not listed in the Constitution doesn't mean that you don't have those rights. And I'm going to jump ahead to 1931, uh, all the way from 1819 to 1931, and most of the cases I'm going to deal with now are from that era, the Great Depression, New Deal era. And that's when a lot of the damage to the Constitution was done. And the case is called O'Gorman versus Hartford Fire Insurance. And this had to do with the rates that insurance brokers could charge in New Jersey. Now, there's a difference between an insurance agent and an insurance broker. An insurance agent is somebody who works for a particular insurance company, State Farm or Allstate or Geico or whatever, and they just sell insurance from that insurance company. And an insurance broker is somebody who is independent and has contacts with lots of different insurance companies. And uh, you go to them and you say, well, I need insurance for such and such, and they will shop around among different insurance companies and they will try to find you the insurance that's right for you and try to get you a good price on it. And so, who pays the insurance broker? Well, the insurance companies pay them. And in New Jersey, the legislature passed a law that limited the amount of money that insurance brokers could get whenever they found insurance for somebody. And surprise, surprise, these amounts were less than they could get in the free market. And even bigger surprise, it was insurance companies that were pushing the legislation. Uh, so the insurance brokers were mad about this, and they said this was a violation of their due process rights. They were being deprived of property, and money is property, without a due process of law. And so this gets to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court basically takes a phrase that they had used a few times earlier, and dusts it off and really dresses it up and starts making a big deal out of it, and it was called the presumption of constitutionality. Okay, well that, that sounds fairly harmless, right? Presumption of constitutionality? Well, except what it really is doing is it's replacing the presumption of liberty. And the presumption of constitutionality is that if Congress or a state legislature passes a law the Supreme Court is going to start with the presumption that it's constitutional. Now, why would they do that? Well, because, of course, Congress or a state legislature wouldn't pass a law that they thought was unconstitutional, right? Of course not. <laughs> so you get this presumption of constitutionality, which replaces the presumption of liberty. So now, instead of presuming that the individual is right, we're going to presume that the government is right. And this shifts the burden from the government to prove that they have a compelling reason for doing what they're doing to the citizen who is being harmed by the government law to prove that it's unconstitutional. Now, I'm a lawyer, and in law, burdens are very important. You have to know when you have the burden of proof and when the other side has it. And you always want the other side to have the first burden of proof because if they don't meet their burden, then you win. and You don't have to do anything. For example, in a criminal case, you're accused of a crime. It's the government's burden to prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And if they don't come up with evidence to prove that, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to testify. You don't have to present evidence. If they don't pr prove that with their evidence, you're, you're not guilty. You get to go home. Okay? So you want the burden always to be on the other side if you can. And so this basically moves the burden from the citizen, from the, from the government to the citizen to prove unconstitutionality. It's basically turning the system upside down. Let's talk about the General Welfare Clause. Now remember, Congress still have power to lay and collect taxes to provide for the general welfare, but it's got to be tied to an enumerated right in the Constitution. This came up in 1937 in the case of Halvering versus Davis, and this was when Congress passed the Social Security Act. And some people were against the Social Security Act, and they came up with an argument, and they said, well, there's no enumerated power in the Constitution that would support Congress having a Social Security Act. And by golly, they were right. <laughs> You'd think that was a pretty good argument, wouldn't you? Uh, well, so the people who were in favor of Social Security said, well, wait a minute, this is for the general welfare. Well, yeah, it's for the general welfare, but what about an enumerated power? you still got to have an enumerated power, right? And then the Supreme Court decided, 
you know what? You don't have to have an enumerated power anymore. We're just going to separate it, separate those two things. General welfare, enumerated powers. If, you, if it's for the general welfare, we're not going to worry about whether there's an enumerated power. Now this, of course, suddenly makes the government tremendously more powerful. They can do a lot more things because all they have to do is say it's for the general welfare. Now I think the general welfare, I think that clause was put in there really as a restriction on government power. Anything you do has to be for the general welfare. Anything you spend taxes on, unless it's for paying a debt or common defense, but it's got to be for the general welfare of the United States. And that it's not just for one state's benefit or the benefit of a few people or something like that. But it's still got to be tied to an enumerated power. That is, until 1937, uh, when the Supreme Court decided that it didn't have to anymore. Commerce Clause, to regulate commerce among the several states, basically to keep trade free running. Now, if you take a law school course on constitutional law, there will be a section in that course where you go through a whole series of Commerce Clause cases, and where you see how the Supreme Court, little by little by little, has just uh, expanded what the Commerce Clause means, so that instead of just being there to make trade run regular among the, uh, among the several states, uh, it gives Congress the power to regulate, and in the strong sense of regulate, uh, almost any economic activity, and it can even be all within one state, because they'll just say, well, that'll affect people in other states somehow, and so uh, it doesn't even have to be across state lines anymore. So I'm not going to go into all the Commerce Clause cases, I'm going to talk about a couple of them. This one I think is really interesting. Uh, this is really kind of double whammy case, and I'll explain what I mean by that. In 1938, the United States versus Caroline products, and the picture that you see is a can of what is called filled milk. And filled milk was regular milk that had the milk fat removed and replaced with some kind of vegetable oil, usually coconut oil. Well, why would somebody do this? Well, it turns out it's a little bit less expensive than regular milk. And, uh, of course, this was the Great Depression. If you could save a few pennies on a can of milk, you might do that. And so well, a lot of people were buying this, and they were pretty happy with it. Uh, some people were not so happy, namely the people who were selling other kinds of milk that were more expensive. So what did they do? Well, first they started a propaganda campaign against filled milk. Don't let your family fall victim to the evils of filled milk. And the mother is protecting her children and saying, stand back, children. It lacks essential vitamins and minerals. Uh, okay. So uh, <laughs> uh, at least here they're exercising their free speech rights. Uh, I don't know how true any of this was, but uh, they're, they're saying things to uh, stop people from buying filled milk. Uh, apparently that didn't work very well because they went further and they went to Congress and they got Congress to pass a law banning the sale of filled milk in interstate commerce. And uh, basically, this, this dealt with uh, people's right to earn a living. They were basically selling a legitimate product that people wanted to buy, and uh, their competitor came along and got Congress to stop them from selling it. And the U.S. Supreme Court said that the commerce power reaches far and wide, and was kind of vague about it. So they said that, uh, that Congress could do this. Now, um, I want to make a comment about this. A lot of people complain these days about how much money there is in politics. And they make a lot of laws about how much money you can give to politicians and so forth. But one of the reasons there's so much money in politics is because of cases like this, Caroline Products. Because what is the lesson from Caroline Products if you're in business? Is it you make a product that people want and sell it at a better price? No, that's what Caroline Products did and they went out of business. The, the lesson from this is if you want to be successful in business, you go to your congressman, you give them lots of money, you get them to pass legislation that will help your business and hurt your competitors. So that is what is going on a lot of the time. Now, since Congress can start to mess around with the, with the economy, they've got something to sell to people in business. And people are willing to go there. And of course, they're giving donations for uh, altruistic reasons, you know, because they want to, to have a better country and everything, uh, not because they're trying to hurt their competitors or anything like that, of course. But uh, if you're worried about too much money in politics, this is one of the reasons that we, that we have this. Now, I'm going to go on and say something else about Caroline products, because as I said, this was a double whammy case. It, it was not just about the Commerce Clause, it was also about the Ninth Amendment, which, as I said before, is about the fact that just because your rights are not listed in the Constitution doesn't mean that you don't have them. And 
Caroline Products has the most famous footnote in constitutional law. It's footnote four. Now, there are lots of footnote fours in U.S. Supreme Court decisions, but if you talk to a law professor and you mention footnote four without any other context, he will know that you're talking about footnote four in Caroline Products. And what does this say? Well, let's take a look at it. There may be a narrower scope for the operation of the presumption of constitutionality. Notice that this is seven years after O'Gorman versus Hartford Fire Insurance, and presumption of constitutionality has become part and parcel of their language now. There may be less scope for it when legislation appears on its face to be within a specific prohibition of the Constitution, such as those of the first ten amendments. Okay, so again, this is kind of some boring legalese, and, you know, what's it really saying here? Okay, uh, is this really anything so important or so insidious? Well, yes, actually it is. Uh, because what they're saying is, let's just take it apart bit by bit, a narrower scope for the presumption of constitutionality. Okay, so they're not so likely to apply the presumption of, of constitutionality in a certain situation, and that's when legislation appears on its face to be within a specific prohibition of the Constitution. So if somebody passes legislation and it goes against a specific enumerated right in the Constitution, they're not going to be quite so fast to have the presumption of constitutionality. Well, wait a minute. If it goes against a specific enumerated right in the Constitution, you shouldn't even be thinking about the presumption of constitutionality because it's unconstitutional, right? If it goes against the Constitution, right? I mean, okay. So that's bad enough to begin with. But also, then they're saying, if it appears on its face to be within a specific prohibition of the Constitution. In other words, an enumerated prohibition of the Constitution. So what they're doing is exactly what the people who were against a Bill of Rights were saying was going to happen in the first place. They are disparaging those rights that are not listed, and they're giving greater weight to those rights that are listed. Okay, so this is a, this is a case is a really bad, really bad news for libertarians for two good reasons. Anybody. Yeah, for anybody. <laughs> anybody who loves liberty. Okay. And I'm going to give you another Commerce Clause case, and this is maybe even worse than Caroline Products. I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a toss-up to me. Uh, there's an argument am among libertarians, but this one is the one I love to hate. When I first studied this in, uh, in law school, it just turned my stomach. 1942, Wickard versus Filburn, and this is about the Agricultural Adjustment Act. And that was an act passed by Congress in which Congress said that they could tell you how much of a certain crop you could grow on your own farm. And they had a reason for this, of course. Um, they wanted to limit the amount of wheat that was grown, for example, and they figured this would make the price of wheat go up, and this would help the farmers. Well, okay, so maybe, maybe the price did go up, but even so, you couldn't sell as much wheat, so I don't know if that actually helped the farmers much at all, and it certainly didn't help this guy, Roscoe Filburn, who filed this lawsuit. He had a small farm. He grew not too much wheat on his farm, and even the commissioner of agriculture admitted that the wheat was all consumed on the farm, either by Roscoe and his family or their animals, and he sold the animals. He didn't sell the wheat. And of course, the, the wheat didn't go out of state. It wasn't sold at all. It didn't go across state lines. And he thought that it was not fair that Congress could tell him how much wheat he could grow on his own property. Well, the Supreme Court allowed Congress to restrict the growing of wheat under the Commerce Clause. Okay, so let's, let's think about this a little bit. The Commerce Clause, sometimes called the Interstate Commerce Clause, okay? And so commerce is buying and selling of goods. So you notice the wheat on Roscoe Filburn's farm was not bought or sold. It was just consumed on the farm. And obviously, it did not go across state lines. So there's nothing interstate about it, and it's not actually commerce. So how does the, how does the Congress have the gall to regulate this under the Commerce Clause? Well, the Supreme Court was very accommodating, and it came up with a rationale for why this was okay. Uh, First of all, they said it's not just whether it's not just that Congress has a right to regulate commerce. Congress has a right to regulate anything that substantially affects commerce. Well, wait a minute. That's not, that's not what it says in the Constitution. 
Uh, that's already expanding the meaning of the Commerce Clause in the Constitution. But even then, you might ask, well, wait a minute. It wasn't growing that much wheat on this farm. This had a stamp, substantial effect on commerce. This wheat, this a guy was growing on this one little farm. And the Supreme Court said, well, wait a minute. There's something called the aggregation principle, which they knew about because they had just made it up. Um, <laughs> and uh, the aggregation principle says it's not just Roscoe Filburn on his one little farm with this small amount of wheat. It's all the little Roscoe Filburns all over the country, all the little guys on their little farms. If you let them grow as much wheat as they want, that's going to substantially affect commerce. And therefore, Congress has the right to regulate this. And Congress and the Supreme Court just love this case. And you will see it cited again and again and again. It's been cited hundreds of times uh, in Supreme Court decisions because this is basically the case that shows that Congress can do almost anything it wants with the Commerce Clause. And they'll say, well, you know, hey, whatever you're complaining about, that's not going as far as they went in Wickard versus Filburn. So obviously, Congress can do that. Uh, unfortunately, the Supreme Court pays a lot more attention to its own precedents than it pays to the Constitution. Now, Obamacare. Now, part of this was recently repealed, but let's, <laughs> let's look at what happened in this case back in 2012, uh, National Federation of Independent Businesses versus Sebelius. Uh, Congress mandate, mandated that everyone would have to buy health insurance. Well, so that brings up this question. Can the government make you buy broccoli? And that was the question that Justice Scalia asked at the oral argument. He said, well, if, if Congress can make you buy health insurance, can it make you buy broccoli? It's supposed to be good for you. Uh, so how far can Congress go? Can it actually make you buy something? Well, interestingly enough, the Supreme Court did recognize some limitation to the Commerce Clause, and they said it's not constitutional under the Commerce Clause for the government to make you buy health insurance. So small victory there, but they decided it is constitutional under another part of the Constitution, and that is the taxing power. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes. So it says, well, we're going to call it a tax, and therefore Congress has the right to do it because it's a tax. Okay? And, and again, it's not tied to any enumerated power in the Constitution. It's tied to the General Welfare Clause, basically. So they're saying it's for the general welfare, it's to make sure everybody has health insurance. And uh, going back to 1937, Halloran versus Davis, basically it's the same rationale as the Social Security Act. It's for the general welfare, but still doesn't have to be tied to an enumerated power anymore. And it just shows if, uh, if the Supreme Court doesn't find one way to excuse <laughs> government power, it'll find another. So... I asked this question earlier, can the Supreme Court strike down acts of Congress? I know some people are very skeptical of that. They say, well, it doesn't actually say that in the Constitution. Uh, but I, I think it does actually say that the Supreme Court has the judicial power. And that is a legal phrase that was understood, which meant that, con that the Supreme Court had the right to decide cases and controversies. It says in the Constitution, the Supreme Court can decide cases and controversies. And if you have a case where somebody believes that they are being harmed by some statute that Congress has passed, and they believe that it's unconstitutional, and it gets to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is going to have to decide that case by deciding whether that particular statute is constitutional or not. So it's going to be part of their job. And also, George Mason, sometimes called the father of the Bill of Rights, said judges could declare an unconstitutional law void. And James Madison sometimes called the father of the Constitution, said a law violating a Constitution established by the people would be considered by the judges as null and void. So I think they do have that right, and I think they should exercise it more than they do. Now, judicial activism? I think judicial, judicial activism is a bad thing if it means the judges are just legislating on their own. They're just making up what they think the law should be. And they're, instead of interpreting the laws that uh, Congress or the state legislature have come up with. But they do have a duty to protect us from overreach by the executive branch and the legislative branch. 
Now, what I'm going to say next is going to be a shock. After all the things that I've said, all the bad things I've said about the U.S. Supreme Court, you're not going to believe that I'm going to say this, but I'm going to say that the Supreme sometimes got it right. Okay? <laughs> Supreme sometimes got it right. What did they get right? Well, for example, there's baby love, <laughs> baby love nothing but heartaches, <laughs> stop in the name of love. Like, I could go on and on. Supremes have a lot of great things. But, um, yeah, um, those Supremes were great. When these Supremes... Not, not as good, but, but sometimes they did get it right. And I'm going to give you an example, some examples of what I call judicial engagement cases. And these are cases of the Supreme Court doing what they're supposed to do. They're, they're stopping the other branches from infringing on our rights. And so in these judicial engagement cases, I'm going to start with Yikuo versus Hopkins, which is from 1886. And this is about a Chinese laundry. Yikuo owned a Chinese laundry in San Francisco. And San Francisco... Uh, passed a law that required permits for any laundries that were in wooden buildings. Now, at first glance, it might seem like this is just a safety regulation. Uh, obviously, uh, you had to have fires in those days to keep the water hot to uh, wash the clothes in. And uh, if you were in a wooden building, it was more likely you could catch on fire. It could spread to other buildings. And, and so that might seem fine, uh, except when you looked a little more closely at what was happening, all the Chinese people who applied for a permit were denied, and uh, all the other people who applied for it uh, got the permit. So this didn't seem fair. It seemed like this was uh, being done in a discriminatory way. And in fact, Yik Wo had passed all his safety inspections, and there were some criminal penalties involved in this, and Yik Wo actually spent some time in jail uh, because of this having a, a laundry in a wooden building without a permit. Uh, so the Supreme Court got this, and they smelled a rat here, and they said this is, uh, this is unconstitutional based on equal protection of the law. This law is being applied discriminatorily on the basis of race and national origin. And so they struck it down. And that's exactly what they should have done. Next case is Lochner, 1905. Lochner versus New York, and this is a case that both liberal and conservative law professors hate. Uh, and they, <laughs> it, it takes a libertarian to love this case. <laughs> uh, and, and so uh, it was overturned eventually. But uh, l let me tell you why the Supreme Court did the right thing there. Now, this was about bakers. And the state of New York passed a law limiting the number of hours that bakers could work per week. Okay, now, you might wonder why they passed this. Uh, maybe it's to save the bakers from overwork or something like that. Uh, probably more likely it was because there were new bakeries that were coming up that had automation. And uh, they knew that if they put limits on how much human workers could do, that they could surpass them in production because there was no law saying you could keep your machines running uh, day and night. So um, anyway, so that seems to be what was behind it. Uh, but uh, the baker said, wait a minute, this is freedom of contract. If that should be between me and my employer. If, if I want to work extra hours and the employer is willing to pay me, we should be able to do that. Why is this the state's business? Now, you may recognize that freedom of contract is not specifically listed in the Constitution. Okay? It's not listed like right to a jury trial or freedom of speech. Uh, but it is basically a, a right that was, has been part of the common law for a long time, going back to England. And this is before O'Gorman versus Hartford Fire Insurance. So it's, um, the, they're not applying the presumption of constitutionality. And the burden was on the state of New York to prove that they had a good reason for this law. And guess what? They didn't. And so the U.S. Supreme Court struck it down as it should. So, let's go on to the Fourth Amendment. Now, the Fourth Amendment, this is one of the great pieces of legal writing in history, in my opinion. This protects us against unreasonable searches and seizures, and it says that police have to have warrants supported by oath or affirmation based on probable cause before they can come in and search your house. Now, there's one thing that's missing from the Fourth Amendment, and I think really the framers knew that uh, courts and uh, Congress were going to have to come up with what's missing from it, and that's any kind of deterrent. In other words, what happens if the police violate this? It doesn't say. 
It just says they're not supposed to do it, but, but what if they search your house without a warrant? Then what happens? Well, the case that came up in 1914 was Weeks versus the United States, and this man, Weeks, was accused of using the U.S. mail for lottery purposes, and that violated a federal law. And so federal agents, without first getting a warrant, broke into his house and seized incriminating letters from his home, and these were used against Weeks at trial as evidence, and he was convicted. And so this case went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court basically said they're going to create a rule for enforcement, and it's the exclusionary rule. And basically what it says is that illegally seized evidence cannot be used as evidence at trial. So this is basically a deterrent for law enforcement. If you don't go get the warrant and you find some incriminating, incriminating evidence, you won't be able to use it at trial. So you better go get that warrant if you want to actually convict somebody. And I'm going to jump ahead now to a more recent case, Obergefell versus Hodges. Uh, this is the same-sex marriage case. And I think this is interesting, uh, it, this is interesting in terms of interpretation. Um, as you know, the Supreme Court said recently that uh, states could not uh, deny same-sex couples the right to get married, just as uh, opposite-sex couples could get married. And I know at the time, uh, I was looking at a lot of the libertarian Facebook pages around Florida, and libertarians were discussing this, and uh, most of them seemed to be fine with the result, but a good thing, they were asking the right question about this, whether the Supreme Court really had the right to make this decision. Should this actually have been a decision that the states make individually? And some of them were raising the point about the Tenth Amendment. Tenth Amendment, of course, says that you know if it's not listed in the Constitution, uh, then the, the government can't, uh, can't do it, the federal government can't do it. But let's take a look at the Tenth Amendment, because it also says something that I didn't emphasize before. It says, powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it, by the Constitution, to the states, are reserved to the states. Okay, so there are certain passages in the Constitution that prohibit the states from doing certain things. They can't pass ex, ex post facto laws, for example, or, or bills of attainder. Uh, they can't declare war, certain things like that. And one of the things they're not allowed to do is in the 14th Amendment, which says, nor shall any state deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. So that's another thing that states are prohibited from doing by the Constitution. So marriage is a protection of the law. And basically what this is saying is that if you're going to have the protection of the law of marriage, and of course states are not required by the Constitution to protect marriage, to recognize it, uh, but every state does recognize marriage, is that if you're going to do that, if you're going to have that, you've got to do it even-handedly. You can't deny it to same-sex couples uh, and just give it to opposite-sex couples. So I think that that was uh, proper for the Supreme Court to, uh, to do, uh, their opinion stating this is not as well reasoned as mine, but um, but still, I think they did come to the, the right result, and they did they did talk about the equal protection clause. They also talked about the due process clause, which I think is irrelevant. Uh, it's really an equal protection clause that that settles it for me. Uh, uh, let me just go back on that. Another thing about this that I think is interesting it has to do with this idea of original intent versus original meaning, and. Uh, I, had, I was explaining the 14th Amendment to a friend recently, and he said, well, you know, the 14th Amendment has, used, has been used to justify all kinds of things that the people who wrote the 14th Amendment never dreamed of. And that's correct. I'm sure that the people who wrote the 14th Amendment were not thinking, oh, this will, there'll be same-sex same sex marriage one of these days, uh, because we're writing this, so they'll apply to that. I'm sure they did not have that in mind. But, you know, when you're writing a constitutional amendment or any part of the Constitution, you're not just looking at the situation that you have in front of you at the time. You want to think about the future and other things that might come up. And that's, that's true of any legislation that you write. You don't always know what situations will come up in life that that legislation will be applied to. So what the framers of the 14th Amendment did was they came up with the general principles is that no state should deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now the problem they were dealing with at the time was the way that blacks were being treated uh, after they had been freed from slavery. 
and they were not getting the equal protection of the law. So that was the immediate problem at the time. But notice this doesn't say anything about race or about blacks and whites. It's, it's, a, it's a deeper principle, it's a broader principle, and that's that no state should deny equal protection of the law to any person. In this jurisdiction, it's a person. It's about individuals, it's not necessarily about groups. So will we ever be a free country again? Well, only if the courts uphold the Constitution. Notice it says shredding the Constitution is not recycling. <laughs> and only if the courts don't let the government tread on our rights. Courts have got to start standing up for us. And we've got to make them start standing up for us. Let's keep the fire where it belongs, in the fireplace, and let's keep the government where it belongs, in the Constitution. Thank you. <laughs>